I'm Michael Rage. Uh, I'm the senior portfolio here, portfolio manager here at Fluke Biomedical. Um, and over time, I've been the product manager for multiple product lines. Um, so definitely built some subject matter expertise over the years. And I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about electrical safety um, and share some of that knowledge I picked up. Well, Jerry's our, our global training manager uh, here at Fluke Biomedical. Um, and he's actually been uh, one of our customers in the past as well, uh, managing his own team uh, of uh, biomeds. Um, so he comes from uh, an area of subject matter expertise uh, of actually doing the doing as well. Um, so his perspective will be really important today. Um, so I think, all right. So today we're gonna talk about the tips and tricks for international electrical safety testing. So the focus today will definitely be on the international standards uh, and Jerry and I will walk you through that. Um, what we're gonna cover today uh, is actually a lot of ground. Um, we're gonna cover why you should perform electrical safety testing at all. Um, and we'll also take a look at the testing standards with a specific focus on the international standards from the IEC. Uh, and finally, we'll go over some tips and tricks to help you with your electrical safety testing. Um, so there's a lot of content to cover today. Uh, so I suggest we jump right in. So I did hear from Jerry, he's logging out and getting back in. So while we do this poll here, let's um, give him a couple of minutes to get logged back in. So. Up on the screen, you'll see one of our first poll questions, and this is an interactive option for you folks to just um, give us some interesting information of what you may or may not know already. There are right answers for some of them, but don't worry, um, they are anonymous. So just give us your best idea of the right answer, and we'll go through the right ones here. So give us yeah, a so click mic and sure. um, see which one we got here. So the question is, which kind of electrical shock is not felt? Is it A, micro shock or B, macro shock? Okay, so let me launch this poll here. And you should, your screen should have changed to a blue screen that gives you an option. We'll leave it open for about a minute and let you guys answer this one and then we'll go through the right answers. Yeah, no wrong answers here. This is more just to uh, kind of gauge your, your understanding and where we should take the conversation today. Getting some good responses here. We're at about 70% of the people that are on the line here have voted so far. So if you just joined us, go ahead and answer the question in the quick poll you've got up on your screen. All right, so I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So it looks like we have 66% of the people chose the first answer, microshock, and 34% of the people chose macroshock. Perfect, well, thanks for reading those out. Um, yeah, the correct answer on this one is microshock. So microshock is the electrical shock that is not felt. Um, and I'll jump into that in a bit more detail. Macro shock is definitely what it sounds like. The larger shocks that are uh, apparent, you know, as current courses through the body. Um, but I want to go through in general uh, electrical shock. Um, so what, one thing before we jump in, you know, electrical safety is, is a very important topic in medical device quality assurance um, and especially in the best practice. Um, when we think about electrical shock, it can cause anything from disruptions during healthcare procedures all the way to injury or even death. Uh, the physiological effects range from a tingling sensation uh, all the way to serious burns in electrocution, you know, the things that we were calling macro shock. Um, excitable human tissue is very sensitive to current in the frequency range uh, of electrical power systems worldwide, which are typically you know, 50 to 60 hertz. Uh, and one thing we'd like to call out here is this freezing current or the let go range. Um, for men, this is about nine to 30 uh, microamps. Uh, and this is when the muscles contract so much that they can't let go of whatever they're holding on to. And basically that opens them up to further damage. Um, so again, that, that current flowing uh, can range anything through, from something you can't feel right, 
to something where you can't let go uh, all the way up to something um, that is harmful to your body. Uh, so it is important that just because you don't feel the current, uh, it doesn't mean that current's not flowing through your body. Um, and Lindsay, um, I will, as we jump into this, uh, I'd be curious to, to hear your story as we jump to the poll question. Sure. So I was telling these guys earlier, we were talking about the poll questions. Have you ever felt an electrical shock? And my fun story is that I grew up on a farm and we had dozens of horses at any given time. And so we had lots and lots of electrical fences. And boy, I tell you, the first time I got my first electrical shock from a, from a fence was definitely an experience I won't forget. So many times throughout the years, but I would fall into the A category of um, definitely have felt my own electrical shock. So let me launch this poll for you guys and um, go ahead and answer yes or no here. And if you are gonna answer yes, if you wouldn't mind putting how or what or where you got your electrical shock in the chat, I'll share a few of those if we get some, some good answers here. So um, if anybody is clicking yes, which we do seem to have quite a few people here that are clicking yes, how did you get electrically shocked and um, by what kind of device? And you can put that in the chat. Yeah, I think a lot of us are going to have those those yes stories, but um, absolutely curious to hear these examples. <laughs> yeah. Um, so light bulb sockets, broken mains, extension lead. I stuck a metal rod into an empty where is that? Empty testing equipment um, into an empty light bulb socket as a kid. Another electrical fence electric fence, um, soldering gun, the troubleshooting of a PCB, lots of different um, home electrical out, outlets, open wires, mains extensions leads, photo lamp, interesting, um, and an electrician two-way intermediate circuits, a wet doorbell, that's interesting, all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's close this poll here, share the results. Um, so 86% said yes, 14% said no. Okay. Oh. As expected, I did not hear as many uh, stories that started or ended with as a kid <laughs> as I thought. <laughs> I Which think, means uh, we all have things to learn, right? When it comes yeah. to electrical shock, even as adults. Absolutely. So let's move on um uh, thank you for sharing those by the way i think another uh, another way way that people get shocked is through batteries i think battery experimentation um and licking them is another way to get shocked um but the concepts are all the same regardless of of how it happens and where it happens um but when it comes to medical devices um a lot of of product standards include requirements for what we're calling leakage current testing um, but the testing for medical products has the most stringent and specific of these tests uh, and the most stringent uh, acceptable limits. So, for example, there are different requirements for patient vicinity, non-patient vicinity, isolated patient contact, non-isolated patient contact, and patient applied voltage. So, in general, leakage current can be defined as the amount of current that flows through the grounding conductor neutral conductor, L2, uh, and other non-grounded electrically conductive points on the medical device. Uh, such leakage currents will flow through the human body no matter whether the medical device is connected directly to ground. Alternately, alternatively, it's the, uh, the leakage current that flows in a battery-powered medical device through the human body on its way to the opposite terminal of the battery. So there's a lot of, of kind of text there, but in general, um, we're talking about current flowing uh, through the human body, right, uh, from the medical device into a grounding source. Um, that's basically what leakage current is, and we want to minimize it because we talked earlier about the dangers uh, of current flow through the human body. Um, but even, you know, only a few years back, uh, it was discovered that patients were dying on the operating table. Uh, from very small amounts of current. Um, 
And as it turns out, the human body is especially susceptible to electrical shock when the skin is broken or open, as when someone is on, on the operating table. Uh, it really only takes a small amount of current in direct contact with the skin to cause cardiac arrest to happen in a healthy person. Uh, with patients in healthcare facilities, you know, these acceptable limits are very low, right? They're, they're measured in micro amperes. Um, some limits for leakage current are even as low as 10 micro amperes. So when we think about medical devices, they're certified with the end use that's specified in the manuals, right? Um, the products are meant to be used where, in, in situations that they were designed for. Um, but sometimes these certified products end up in the wrong place. Um, for example, right, you might have an ordinary television or an office computer that might end up in a patient area or a surgery room. Uh, these products would most likely not pass the requirements for medical equipment, but in a situation where a patient was especially vulnerable, uh, they could cause shock or cardiac arrest. Uh, and here's a good example of that. You might have a two wire lamp uh, that's next to the patient bed. Uh, and there might be a saline filled catheter that's being used to measure blood pressure and the pressure monitor is grounded. So saline is a good conductor and then you have the patient touching the lamp case and then fibrillation might occur. So if you think about that, you took an ungrounded lamp, the saline and a grounded uh, blood pressure monitor um, and that basically caused that circuit and current to flow through the patient. That example doesn't sound all too far-fetched anymore, does it? Another thing to note is healthcare workers. Uh, they're often touching the equipment and the patient at the same time, which increases the exposure to hazard, the hazards from improper equipment. So it's not just the equipment itself that can transmit current, as we'll show in the following example, but uh, the, the humans that are interacting with each other. So in this example, you might think about uh, a blood pressure catheter uh, and an ECG system, they're all connected to a patient that's laying down uh, in an electric bed. The bed's ground connection is broken, right? So this is the failure in the system, um, but there's seemingly no problem. And then an operator might come in contact with that bed and then touch the catheter at the same time, basically closing that circuit. Uh, and then current will flow through the, the stray capacitance in the bed through the operator to the ECG system. Uh, and then this current is what would cause cardiac fibrillation in this case, uh, as well as interference in the ECG signal. Um, so again, it doesn't have to be direct contact with the patient. Uh, it can also be indirect contact uh, and current can flow human to human. And, so do yeah, think we'll, about the we'll entire talk a situation. We'll more about that uh, in, in a few minutes, in a couple of slides. We'll, we'll talk very detailed about that, right, Mike? Absolutely. Welcome back, Jerry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so in general, this is kind of the story about why we have to test medical devices, right? We know what can go wrong. Uh, and in order to prevent that from happening, we need to test medical devices for safety. Um, the safety that we're referring to here is the prevention of electric shock to patients and operators. So I want to take a second to define some of the acronyms on this slide before I continue. Um, these acronyms we're using to describe uh, where or by whom the work is being done. So OEM stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer. Uh, think about the companies out there like a GE or a Philips. And then we have HL, which we're using as an abbreviation for hospital. Um, so we'll get into that, that detail in just a bit. Um, but in general on this slide, there are a lot of types of testing, uh, but they do fall into three main buckets. Uh, so one bucket is acceptance testing. So acceptance testing is done upon, you know, upon arrival for that medical device at the medical facility. Uh, this type of testing verifies that the device has been delivered in an acceptable condition before it's put into use. Um, and really, this performance and electrical safety testing is done uh, as part of a reference for future maintenance. So it, and, it defines and, the starting point. And, it ha and it's important. Acceptance testing 
is not just when the medical device is brand new, but if the medical device was sent away from the hospital for someone else to repair and comes back, that's another acceptance testing situation. You need to run the tests before you put the medical device back into clinical use. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a bucket uh, called after service and repair testing, right? And and just like Jerry said, this is performed, you know, following a repair or a product upgrade. Um, this can be done in the hospital or outside of the hospital. But again, if you're if the, the medical device left the facility, when it comes back, you should uh, perform acceptance testing again. If you're doing the repair or product upgrade um, in the hospital itself, you should perform testing as well. Um, in many cases, you know, a more rigorous electrical safety test is needed after the replacement of components or even the reconfiguration of the medical device. Um, and again, this work can be done by hospital biomeds, um, by independent service organizations, ISOs, uh, or those OEM field service organizations. But again, if you if you if you've tinkered with, you know, repaired or serviced the medical device, you should perform electrical safety testing afterwards before putting it back into use. Um, and then the third bucket is is routine testing, also known as planned preventive maintenance. Um, this type of testing is, is conducted at fixed time intervals, which vary between the types of equipment or the manufacturer's recommendation, uh, or even some risk assessment procedures that you might be carrying out in your facility. Uh, this work can be done by hospital biomeds, ISOs as well, or OEM field service organizations. So. A lot of these can be done by various groups of people, um, but the story is, you know, if you've changed the medical device, please do electrical safety testing. Please do it preventatively over time um, because these devices do fail. Um, and there's there's actually another bucket that I did want to touch on uh, where we have a couple bullet points here, where there are types of testing being conducted by the OEM at the time of product design. Um, so these types of testing would fall under the categories of uh, at type testing, bench testing, validation and verification, also known as, as V and V, um, all while the product is in research and development. Um, and there's also electrical safety testing that's done uh, as that product leaves the production line, right? Um, so when you're doing acceptance testing, you're really trying to figure out, okay, the manufacturer said it was okay, it was shipped and arrived at my facility, did anything go wrong? In the interim. So Jerry, anything to add there before we move on? No, I think uh, that's well covered for the moment and, uh, and because some of these things we'll get into a little bit more detail as we go. Perfect. Uh, then Jerry, why don't you start to walk us through the standards? Yeah, so there are a variety of standards, both international standards under IEC, um, as well as local national standards, which would be something like the NFPA 99, which is actually an electrical code, and it applies, that one applies only to the United States. So um, the international standards that are most typically useful to us are the IEC 60601-1 and the IEC 62353. Now, the IEC 60601 applies to the medical device manufacturer. So it's it's, um, it is for them to use in their design validation testing, also called type testing. It could also be used by the hospital for acceptance testing, but it includes some tests that would tend to shorten the useful life of the medical device. So we don't wanna keep using that standard over and over and over. More in, in addition to that, these tests, there's a much longer list of tests that need to be done with specific amounts of time uh, for each test in terms of how long the voltage should be applied, things like that. So these are really designed for design validation testing. IEC 62353 is what we would use for routine uh, recurring testing, so scheduled electrical safety tests as part of a uh, bigger uh, test procedure about the medical device that we're going to do periodically, maybe once a year or twice a year. Um, that way, 
um, what what that is is think of 62353 as a bit of a subset of the IEC 60601-1 that strips out those tests that would tend to shorten the useful life of the medical device. IEC 61010, we'll talk a little bit more. It's really very special. It's broader than the application that we're gonna talk about, i.e. clinical laboratory devices. And we'll talk about that one a little bit because I know internationally, we get a lot of questions about 61010, what about that? And a lot of worries about not understanding what the tests are. So we'll we'll move on and we'll begin to talk about these kind of one by one. All right, so as we move on, we're gonna to jump to the next poll question. Um, so I'll walk through the questions uh, as Lindsay pulls it up, but why should you use IEC standards? And this is a multiple choice, so select all that are correct here. Um, is it because the IEC standards are tried and true? Is it because the IEC standards are created by experts from medicine, academia, and industry? Or is it because the IEC standards evolve with revisions regularly? And you can okay. check more than one. More than one is okay. <laughs> Just tell I'm us gonna, what you think. Sure. I'm gonna launch this poll here and um, give it about a minute for you folks to respond and then we'll go through the answers and then uh, Mike and Jerry will give us a little more information about this one. Got lots of different answers here, so I think that's great. About 15 more seconds here. I see we've got about 75 to 80 percent of the people have voted so far. Oh, good. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll. Any last minute additions? Last chance, last chance. Okay, there we go. So closing the poll here, and I'm going to share the results. So 63% of the people chose the first one. The standards are tried and true. 73% chose the second option. The standards are created by experts, and 83% chose the last one. So uh, trickle down 63, 73, and 83. Interesting. Good responses. Very good. Uh, all three do apply. So we'll show you that. All three apply, and this is especially important in emerging market countries, and we have a lot of those. Uh, Lindsay noted we had uh, at least Kenya from the continent of Africa. Uh, we have a participant or two from there, and other parts of even Middle East, and certainly parts of Asia Pacific, and, um, and even uh, Central and South America. So, Countries don't always adopt this uh, the, or create their own local national standard. They don't always immediately adopt the IEC standards, which by the way, are not just about electrical safety, but also about performance testing of the medical devices by category of medical device. Really important to understand these three concepts. The standards are tried and true. They're used every day all over the world. Um, in countries that have adopted them, and countries do um, uh, harmonize to the international standards with their own local national standards. For example, uh, China has done that. Uh, Australia and New Zealand have done that. So there are lots of situations where the local national standard gets adjusted to be a little bit more, a uh, little bit tighter testing requirements or some additional tests that weren't called out by the international standard that are believed to be important to that particular country. So still, they're all based on the international standards and they're good and safe to use. Uh, they are created by experts from medicine, academia, and industry. And in fact, if you were able to travel and be part of the, um, uh, the um, standards committees, you could, provide input to the standards yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. They welcome the input from all parts of the world with all points of view in order to make sure that these standards are meaningful. 
the standards do evolve and there are revisions regularly, although not every year, not every month. Um, typically, every three to five years, there may be some revisions to the standard and how they apply it depends on what those changes were and, and, and the rationale. So good to use, even if your country has not adopted any minimum performance and safety standards, including electrical safety, there's no reason why a particular hospital couldn't say in their medical advice quality assurance plan, we will use international standards until our country creates its own. No reason why that should bother anybody, and you'll always be safe. I'm going to pose a question to you that I always pose, and that is, how do you want the medical device to work if you or somebody you love are the next patient that will be connected to it? Answer that simply, and then you'll know why you would want to start off by using the international standards, no matter whether your country is going to enforce the use or not. Be safe, make sure your patients are safe. No, great point, Jerry. Um, so I think as we jump in, let's learn more about uh, IEC 60601-1. Okay, so as I said, um, it's about, uh, it. the reason it's created is for the medical device manufacturer, and it's used in different, several different parts of of that manufacturing process. It's used in design validation or type testing uh, by their engineering department as they create the medical device or the next version of the medical device. They're used in the production line in the final assembly testing before they ship that medical device to its end user destination. That would be the hospital that you're working in, for example. And then they, could be used by you in the hospital for acceptance testing, for those incoming inspections, both when the medical device is brand new, as well as if it was sent away for repair and it comes back. Um, the reason is because you wanna make sure that that medical device has been returned to um, minimum uh, performance and safety before you put it back into clinical use. So it's mainly focused on the medical device manufacturer, 60601-1. Okay. And for a while, we had some differences between the second edition of 60601-1 and the third. And in particular, in the third edition, what we used to call enclosure leakage we now call touch current. And uh, as an example of what is touch current, Lindsay, to expand on your example of the electric fence, uh, what else happened with that? Sure, so I have an older brother and um, as you may expect, there's a um, an opportunity for us to grab a hold of one person and the fence at the same time. And I never received the shock, but I definitely shocked my brother more times than I care to admit. <laughs> a perfect so, yeah. example of what we mean by touch current. So Mike alluded to this a little bit earlier where the clinician, the nurse or the doctor is touching the medical device and also touching the patient electrical current will flow. And you can prove this by, uh, by using your electrical safety analyzer and, and a partner, a buddy, and you touch the medical device, your buddy touches you, and then your buddy also holds on to the measurement probe of the electrical safety analyzer, and you will see the amount of current that is gonna flow through you from the medical device through you, through your buddy to the safety analyzer. It will flow, there will be a current. And our job for electrical safety is to find out where is electrical current flowing and how much is flowing. And we also will test it under normal condition, which would be correct wiring and uh, the ground uh, fully connected as well as single fault conditions, which would be 
opening the neutral and seeing how much electrical current is going to flow through other pathways and then restoring that and opening the ground to see how much current will flow along other pathways. So how much current and where is it flowing is what we need to document. And we really want the worst case situation. So touch current is all about this. Clinician touches the medical device and the patient at the same time, how much current is gonna flow there. And this is true no matter whether we have a class one or a class two device or whether we have a hybrid class one where there is no uh, ground test point, no protective earth test point, but, um, but we still need to make a leakage current measurement. So this is called touch current because when you touch, current will flow. And in this case, a lot of the medical devices today, the newer ones, are completely plastic. There is no conductive test point anywhere. And this test, touch current, is supposed to be a measurement of how much leakage current is going to flow to an ungrounded conductive test point within the where the patient or the clinician could touch the medical device at that point. That's where it's supposed to happen. But because there's all wrapped in plastic, the question would be, now what? And the answer to that, whether it's IEC 60601-1 or IEC 62353, is that we wrap the touchable surface of the medical device with a couple of thicknesses of aluminum foil. We tape that down with and just any kind of tape. And then we connect our test lead from our electrical safety analyzer to the aluminum foil. And what will happen here is we have created a capacitor. That is, inside the medical device, we have conductors. The plastic around the medical device, that enclosure is an insulator. And then we put the aluminum foil on the outside to simulate the clinician so we have another conductor. Because you and I and clinicians and the aluminum foil are electrically conductor, conductive. So we're gonna measure how much leakage current could flow if the clinician or the patient touches the medical device on the outside, even, even if there's no conductive point available. And there will be some there, and we do need to test it, as I said, under both normal condition and single fault conditions. So the aluminum foil is just gets taped down so it stays in place on a touchable surface. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lindsay, for the anecdote, for the little story, because I think it really brings home what's going on there. You're welcome. Anytime. Okay, so now let's talk about the IEC 62353. And remember what I said, the 60601-1 standard includes tests that could shorten the useful life of the medical device if we use them over and over and over again, year over year, year over year. So the 62353 was actually created um, and recommended by um, Austria um, and their team uh, as a subset of the tests in 60601-1 just enough to be able to sure, be sure that the medical device was still uh, safe and effective for clinical use. So that became the IEC 62353. It's been around for a while. I think it's still on version two uh, at this point, but it's a little less complex. But there are three different test methods that we'll need to choose from, and I'll get into that in a minute. 62353 is useful when um, uh, for OEM, for the manufacturer's field service team to use, because they're going to be doing electrical safety tests on the medical devices they service over and over and over again. So it works for them. And it also works for all of us that work inside the hospital or other medical facilities to run those electrical safety tests and typically we're gonna run them once per year. So uh, even on the most risky uh, medical device. So 
that's who the 62353 applies to. Um, we're going to rely on the manufacturer's brand and model specific service manual for the test procedure that we're going to follow, but it will almost always have electrical safety included in that test procedure. So sometimes it refers to 60601-1 and other times it refers to 62353. If it doesn't say which one, contact the manufacturer and ask the question because they should be telling you which standard they're using for the electrical safety portion of the test. And if it's 62353, they should be telling you which test method that they recommend to be used. So Jerry, you bring up test method. Mm -hmm. um, how should people choose the right method for 62353? Well, it's a really good question, Mike. And so the IEC 62353 standard includes this decision tree, I'll call it. You may look at it and say, well, Jerry, that's a flow chart. Yeah, it's a flow chart that helps you make the decision about which test method you should use. And we start at the left at the top um, with the, the, what the task is, measurement of leakage current. And then we, the first test, the question that we come down to is, is this an electrical safety class one device or not? Class one meaning, typically meaning that it has an accessible ground test point and um, that it has a three prong uh, power cord plug. So that would mean L1, L2 and ground on, on the uh, power cord plug. So if the answer is, you can see the decision tree how it goes. If the answer is no, it's not class one, that means it's either class two or class IP, class IP meaning internal power, like a battery powered device. So the answer is no, we come down and we ask the question, ins insulation testing resistance uh, measurement required. And so by this we mean, what is the quality of the insulators around each of the conductors in the power cord and around the conductors in the patient applied parts of the patient electrically conductive connections. And so those are not always required. If the manufacturer or if the if the manufacturer of the medical device requires insulation tests, then we have to do it. Uh, if the uh, local electrical codes or local national standards require insulation testing, we have to do it. Otherwise we don't. And so that's why the no, okay? And then the no says, okay, we don't have to do that. If the answer is yes, then we just go back down through a little, did it pass insulation resistance or not? Insulation resistance is measured in mega ohms, very high resistance. So anything above whatever that minimum uh, 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 quality in resistance value is would be what we, what we're looking for. And then you go to the rest of the decision tree and it helps us decide, is it the direct test method? Is it the differential test method or the alternative test method? And today I don't wanna go into big detail about this, but I will just remind you that this, is, this decision is made at acceptance testing for a brand new medical device that is not already in your inventory. So you're gonna decide 62353, which test method, you're gonna use this decision tree to help you figure that out, all right? And then whatever you come up with as your decision, you stick with, and that becomes the, for that brand and model or for that model or category of medical device, that is the test method that you're going to use. Direct is the safe one because it is the most um, like the IEC 60601-1, which is what was used by the manufacturer in the final assembly test before they shipped it to you. So if you want continuity and, and um, uh, of measurements, the direct method is really the best one. But there are other situations in the design of the medical device that may allow you to use the differential method or the alternative method. And those are spelled out in this decision tree.
but this is part of the IEC 62353, and you really should get um, a copy of that. Uh, your hospital should buy a copy of that so you can get a hold of this decision tree and then use it effectively in designing in deciding which test method you should be using. Uh, by okay. the way, yes. Sorry to interrupt there, um, but we are at about 45 minutes past the hour, so just a quick time check okay. here for you. Keep going then, um, because we have other uh, webinars and so forth that go into much more detail about 62353. So I know we have some people in the US on the phone. Let's just briefly touch on NFPA 99, um, but uh, note that uh, there is an NFPA 99 specific webinar that's available for download off of the website as well. Yeah, in, 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 indeed. The NFPA 99 comes from National Fire Protection Agency who cares the most about fire protection. And it's not really from their point of view about patient safety from electricity. It's about fire protection. The NFPA 99 requires that there be measurements made for electrical safety testing um, uh, when the device is brand new and when the device has been repaired. And then all other times, uh, it's just a visual inspection. So there are much fewer times that we're going to actually make measurements with an electrical safety analyzer. The rest of the story is the NFPA 99 is also um, kind of the tests that it wants are a subset of the tests that would have been done under IEC 60601-1. It is a little different than the 62353, but, other, but also in ways similar. And it's a good one to use, and it is absolutely widely used, but only in the United States. Okay, so it's useful oh. by biomets. Okay, keep going. All right, IEC 61010. I wanna cover this really briefly. This standard is really about the entirety of the medical device design. And in fact, we use it in designing our test instruments as well. But the reason it comes up in biomed and hospitals is because the um, uh, the clinical laboratory uh, requirements include that the manufacturer of clinical laboratory equipment perform two tests uh, under IEC 61010. And those tests are applied voltage. If the clinical laboratory equipment fails that test, then you have to perform the applied are accessible, I'm sorry, accessible voltage and accessible leakage if the accessible voltage failed. And if it passes the accessible leakage, then everything's good, it can be installed, and you can begin to use the clinical laboratory equipment. However, once it's been installed and these tests have been performed, after that, we use the appropriate test method under IEC 62353 for periodic testing after that. All right. So let's move on to what if what what if people have to test more than five applied parts? Yeah. So our safety analyzers, um, the ones that are more portable, have only five applied part or patient connection lead posts on them, and we do need to be doing those patient connection leakage current tests. But if you have a defibrillator, you may have up to 14 patient con connections that are electrically conductive. Um, for electrical safety only, we are allowed to connect all together, short all together, or connect all together, the, the patient connections that are uh, of the same electrical type. So if we're just talking about ECG electrodes and defibrillator pads or paddles, those are all typically electrical safety type CF, meaning cardiac float or isolated from ground 
uh, with low leakage, the lowest leakage current uh, test limit value. So these typically are things that would need a 10 microampere or less uh, leakage current uh, me uh, measurement in order to pass the test. So we could connect all of the ECG leads. For example, you're seeing here a uh, 12 lead cable, which is 10, 10 lead wires. Those are connected on this one to 10 adapter that is an accessory to our safety analyzers, all of them, to allow that um, this, the patient applied part test to be done. And you could connect one or more. So if you have some patient electrical patient connections that are like temperature, which would be a temperature sensor is a type B, meaning it's grounded, uh, or BF, meaning body float, which allows a higher leakage current, or CF, each of those would need, if you have more than one, um, one of those that that you need to connect and you only have five lead posts to connect to, you could use a one to 10 adapter as long as you keep the all of the same type applied parts connected together on a particular one to 10 adapter. Or if you had now coming out soon, you will see 15 and 18 lead ECG. Well, right away we have way more and more than 10. So we might connect two one to 10 adapters together, daisy chained and in series and connect all our ECG lead wires, for example, to those two um, one to 10 adapters. And again, this is for the purpose of patient applied part electrical leakage current measurements only. When we talk about ECG simulations, it's a different story. No, great point there. All right, the next thing we wanted to talk about was point-to-point -point testing. Yes, so we have a couple of different situations. I'll try and cover these really quickly so we leave some time for Q&A. Um, we do supply a 50-foot test lead uh, uh, for doing a couple of different kinds of tests. So in the United States, under our electrical safety code, our national electrical code, when you do an installation of an equally potentially grounded room or treatment area, this could be a surgery room or it could be uh, another area where the patient is going to be particularly vulnerable to leakage currents. We would say we want everything that's made of metal that would be connected to ground, we want those connected to the same ground and it want, we want it to be a dedicated ground that doesn't go anywhere but from that location to earth, right into the earth. Straight there, nowhere else, doesn't share with anything else. But every metal surface in that room, every uh, mains power connection in that room, the ground will be connected to this dedicated location. Equally, potentially grounded area. There are tests that need to be done that cause us to need to move around that room within six feet of any patient treatment area within that room and test each of the metal surfaces to make sure that there are no, uh, that all the voltages, which should be zero by the way, but all of the voltages are the same, that there's no stray current created by a what we call a ground loop, which means there is the ground wire has is someplace in the room may have a different ground location than this dedicated ground we want it to be to. So that's one testing scenario. The installers of the medical devices in that room, um, the electricians should do this test, but if they don't, before you put it into clinical use, you you should do that particular test. Okay, that's one use of this big long test lead. You would connect it to the black wire because this is not a situation where you have a power cord you can plug into the electrical safety analyzer. The other time you're going to use point to point testing is when you have a class IP device or a permanently connected to mains 
device like an MR or a CT scanner or something like that uh, where there's no power cord plug. And in those cases, the point-to-point -point test means the black lead wire goes on some reference point. It may or may not be ground, but some reference point. Your red lead wire is going to go to each of probably several measurement locations, and the voltage or leakage current will be with the where you touch the red test lead with respect to that reference point that you have chosen. So in some cases, again, you might use this long test lead because MR units and some MR units, some CT units have a breakout box that allows you access to the appropriate uh, L1, L2, and ground. You would connect the black lead wire with an alligator clip to that ground, and you would move around the room to the other locations with your test uh, electrical safety analyzer to make your leakage current measurements there. Um, if it's a class IP, you're going, your reference point is going to be as near as you can get to the opposite terminal on the battery because all the current's going to flow it, with reference to the other terminal of the battery, so positive to negative. Okay. All right, one last one. Testing uh, ultrasound transducers. In particular, we're talking about transesophageal echocardiograph transducers, TEE. -E. Now, there's two different ways to do these tests. If you do the test with the TEE uh, transducer connected to the diagnostic ultrasound device, then you're going to use some aluminum foil, the ultrasound gel, and you're going to wrap the transducer face with the gel in that aluminum foil and connect your test lead for applied part testing to that aluminum foil. All right, so that test lead is going to be connected where? to the top lead posts um, that in, in order to connect that uh, TEE probe appropriately for the test. If um, all the rest of the electrical safety test for leakage to ground and the touch current test are gonna be done uh, in the standard way because these diagnostic ultrasound systems have a power cord plug that you will connect to the safety analyzer. All right, so that's if the transducer is connected to its ultrasound system. But in many parts of the world and in the United States today, the standard of care requires that the TEE probe be disinfected between each patient use and that during that disinfection, it be tested for leakage current. The reason for that is there are times when the patient will actually bite through the uh, the armor shielding of that TEE probe and create an ingress of fluid and a pathway for electrical leakage to flow. And you got to remember, behind the face of those TEE transducers, there sits uh, about 400 to 800 volts of potential that only need a little resistance to produce a current flow. And that current flow will be overwhelming to the uh, to the patient's heart and conduction. The TEE transducer goes in the esophagus and images out from behind the heart, so it's sitting very close to the heart. So we really do need to do these tests during cleaning. We show in this case a cleaning tub and a TEE probe in the tub. Um, and in the, this case, um, we the this would be done initially by central processing or the cleaning technician if it and they will use something called the ULT 800 um, that makes it safe if this is a battery powered test instrument makes it safe to do the supplied part test while they're disinfecting the transducer if it fails that test they're going to they should be calling biomed they should be calling you you're going to bring your electrical safety analyzer up to get a actually a measured leakage current value, and you will send that along with that transducer either we, uh, to exchange that transducer for a, uh, a different one or to uh, get it repaired, 
by a third-party provider that, that can do transducer repairs. So those are the two testing situations. In the, in the second case where we're doing the cleaning and we're, we're using our big safety analyzer to replace the ULT-800, we have a little pigtail, you can see it there, with a red part connected to the safety analyzer. And then the opposite end has the appropriate connector for the uh, ULT-800 uh, transducer adapter and the uh, test probe that's gonna go into the cleaning solution. So more to follow on that, but visually, I want you to see there are two ways to do this test. And we do need to make the measurement um, and, and get the pass-fail value. Perfect. Well, I see that we're a minute over. Um, I want to hand it over to Lindsay to close us out real quick and then move over to Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. So what you see on the screen right now is just a quick thank you to um, to you folks here. I had a couple of people reach out in the chat about the on-demand webinars and where to learn more. So Jerry, do you want to talk a little bit about the Advantage Training Center? Sure. So um, on our website, there's a tab called Knowledge Center. And under when you click on Knowledge Center, you get some options. One of them is the Advantage Training Center where you will find academic style courses uh, that end with an exam. And if you, when you pass the exam, which by the way, you can take as many times as you want until you pass, um, you will receive a certificate of completion. And that is useful to show your boss or to show anybody who cares uh, in terms of professional development that you are continuing your education year over year, not once and done, but you're doing continuing ed. So that's one option. The other option is uh, we have other options, including our webinars archive, and that includes our Empower webinars, and you can earn additional um, certificates of participation and uh, CEU credits. Uh, when you view the recorded Empower webinars that are found there. Additionally, there is the video library where we have um, videos that introduce test instruments um, from the, that are in our product line and that also show you application videos about how you would use the test instrument in, in, your, in your doing your testing every day. So I encourage you to go there and take advantage of all of these trainings that are available, did we say they're free of charge? They are, so it doesn't cost you anything but a little bit of time, and they're available to you when you have time. Thanks, Jerry, much appreciated. 